I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now!, a daily grassroots, unembedded, international, um, inter uh, independent news hour. And we broadcast over 220 radio, public radio and television stations around the country, public access TV now on PBS, and on Free Speech TV, which is channel 9415 of Dish Network. We're also broadcasting on radio stations across Canada, across Australia, in Europe. We're the largest public media collaboration in this country. Okay, and um, when you say, uh, when a, a freedom of uh, the press is enshrined in the, the Constitution, then uh, they serve as a megaphone. So uh, I guess when I'm, uh, as opposed to, uh, well, how do you see the media as a megaphone? Mm -hmm. um, the, the media acts as a megaphone for those in power instead of acting as a check and balance, holding those in power accountable. It simply amplifies what they say, and that's not what's supposed to be what happens. I mean, I always say that ours is the only profession protected by the U.S. Constitution because we're supposed to be the check and balance on government, but that's not what the media is doing. It's reached an all-time low. Um, can I ask something? I'm, yeah. I'm not quite sure what you're doing. Well, this, okay, is, okay. this is, you are saying don't say what I usually say? No, 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 no I'm, oh. not, I'm not. I'm just saying that I'm just trying to give you sound bites. Well, I'll, I'll just ask a question, like, uh, like I guess I'm just throwing you off by trying to do it, like, Ooh. like giving you a starting point and then going from there. Right, um, and the reason you don't want to take parts to the speech is because you don't want to have it as a speech. Right, I just want to have it, this as an interview. Yeah, okay. So. Um, so but, sort of to make those points. Right, for my, my piece that I'm doing. Right. So I guess to uh, transition, how do you, how um, did you, oh, Okay, go ahead. How did you see the, um, the Bush administration kind of using uh, the UN as a pretext to go to war? Well, the Bush administration didn't work very well with the United Nations at all. In fact, was involved with bugging members of the UN Security Council, uh, monitoring them tapping their phones and their faxes uh, to try to find out what it was that they were, how they were planning and talking, the different countries. Um, George Bush always made it clear he had no interest in the UN, but then a lot of people clearly were putting pressure on him, and certainly Tony Blair, the prime minister. Um, and so they had to make some kind of pretense uh, about getting UN approval, but had a very hard time doing that. How do you see um, the kind of the decline of investigative reporting um, as opposed to more beat reporting uh, in the media leading up to the war? Did you, did you notice the, that? The media reflects the establishment consensus, and before the war, the Democrats joined the Republicans for the most part in uh, supporting the invasion. And so because the media brings you that very small spectrum between the Democrats and the Republicans, when the Democrats agree with the Republicans, they bring you no spectrum of opinion. So you had mainstream America against the invasion. And you had, I won't call it a mainstream press, I will call it an extreme press. You had this extreme press instead beating the drums for war, the four major nightly newscasts uh, out of 393 interviews they did in the week leading up to and after Colin Powell's address, push for war at the United Nations, of the 393 interviews, three were with anti-war representatives. That does not represent mainstream America. Mainstream America was for more inspections and diplomacy. Um, the majority of people in this country, that was a media that just iced out dissent. So what could have the media done better in the lead up uh, towards war? Their job, the media could have done their job. Um, and that is to bring us the full diversity of opinion and not as a, act as a conveyor belt for the lies of the administration. That's exactly what they did. I mean, you look at the paper of record, the New York Times, um, Judith Miller, the chief national security correspondent, these front page stories over and over again, um, talking about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that's... She, and she is using unnamed sources 
um, there's no check and balance on the government. She is just naming the government. And then you have her publisher, um, Punch Salzberger, saying, well, it's not her fault. The administration should have done a better job investigating this. What is he talking about? Uh, she's not the press secretary for the administration. She's supposed to be checking what they say. And the reason it matters when the media acts as a conveyor belt for the lies of the administration is the lies take lives. That's why it matters. Okay. And um, when you hear uh, David Kay um, say, why did we get it so wrong, what do you think of? I think that the media is responsible. You expect... <laughs> oh, God. You are right? Yeah. Okay, just start. We, we expect governments to lie. Um, the great journalist I.F. Stone said to journalism students, if you're going to remember two words in this class, governments lie. So we expect that. But what we don't expect is that the media uh, will simply act as stenographers to those in power, um, just write down those lies. Um, because people in the old Soviet Union, they knew to read behind, between the lines of Pravda. But in this country, you sort of have the sense that there is a media that is functioning, that is filtering, critiquing, analyzing, investigating, and that there are many channels, much diversity, but it's not true. It matters who owns them and what their views are, and those owners are becoming fewer and fewer in this country. We're in the midst of the largest media consolidation this country has ever seen. Um, and so, what was the question? Oh, that's, that's, that's good. Uh, I mean, uh, when, why did... When you say, when you hear David Kay say, oh, oh, David why did you get it so right, wrong? Right. Um, and, and getting, and I guess, uh, specifically, oh, I mean, like, listen, getting listen. more people before. Um, I mean, the media, uh, there were lots of people who were seriously questioning the evidence. They just weren't allowed on the media. They were completely marginalized. You had people like David Kay, the weapons inspector, who was on continually. Bruce Ritter was also a weapons inspector. Um, Scott Ritter. Sorry. Scott Ritter was also a weapons inspector. And he said that there weren't weapons of mass destruction. We hardly saw him on television. Although years before, when he was much more hawkish, he was everywhere. Um, people were there. The weapons inspectors, a number of them, were saying the in intelligence doesn't hold up. Intelligence analysts from the CIA were saying this is not true, but the media simply wasn't giving voice to them because they, their views diverge from the establishment consensus. Uh, I'm going to have to leave it there. If you look at the way the media covered the lead up to the invasion, um, it definitely reached an all time low. And it all has to be challenged, dissected, analyzed. In the months leading up to the invasion, well, let's look at September 2002. You had first Andrew Card, the chief of staff of George Bush, um, being asked at the beginning of September why they weren't pushing harder for war to justify the invasion. And he says, from a marketing point of view, you don't roll out new products in August. Uh, this is the former GM lobbyist, General Motors lobbyist. Um, so the beginning of September, the propaganda blitz begins. On September 7th, uh, Prime Minister Blair and George Bush hold their news conference at Camp David, and they say that Saddam Hussein is just six months away from getting nuclear weapons. They are citing an IAEA report, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, the mainstream journalists, for the most part, uh, simply repeat this. I think the Washington Post had somewhere buried in their story there might not have been such IAEA report, and in fact there wasn't, and Mohammed el Baradi said that. Um, but that did not uh, influence what the mainstream reporters said. They simply acted as a conveyor belt for the lies of the administration. Um, the New York Times comes out with a piece the next day. It's a Sunday morning. This is, uh, you know, everyone's back to school and work after uh, the holidays. It's a very critical time, and the Bush administration is ramping up the... Okay. Um, so repeat the question then. Okay. Um, when is the right time to question more and talk to uh, the perspective of how media covers that, that question? 
the critical time to question war is before it happens, and that's precisely what the media didn't do, is they acted as a conveyor belt for the lie. We're not going to be able to do this. Yeah, that's just, you know, when you're talking about the, the conveyor belt of lies and, uh, you know, when's the right time to question war. Okay. Um, the time to question war is before it happens. The time for the media to lay out the evidence of which there was so much that indicated the administration was lying. But instead, they acted as a conveyor belt for the lies of the administration. Um, you have in August and September, in the lead up to war, Bush and Blair making their case for nuclear weapons, uh, that Saddam Hussein was about to get them. And rarely did the media challenge this. The corporate networks certainly didn't. And yet there were those who were saying this isn't true. Those who are in a position to know, like Mohammed al Baradi, who is the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, saying they're citing reports that we have not come out with, and they're citing our reports. And the newspaper reporter is the same. Rarely were they showing, exposing, what was very clear at that time and what many people were saying around the world, as well as right here. There were weapons inspectors who were saying that the evidence didn't hold up. They were simply iced out at that time. And um, you have the networks cheerleading for war. You know, at that time, they're developing their graphics. Uh, in the lead up to war, on the eve of the war, and MSNBC, Phil Donahue is fired from MSNBC. And an NBC secret memo is leaked that says very clearly that at a time when the other networks would be waving the flags, they didn't want Phil Donahue as their flagship program who was presenting anti-war points of view. Um, and so they unceremoniously dumped him. The networks were unabashed in this. On the day of the bombing of Iraq, Dan Rather saying, good morning, Baghdad. Uh, Tom Brokaw saying, we don't want to destroy the infrastructure of Iraq because we're going to own the country in a few days. The message was very clear. Um, Dan Rather actually made the point himself, the CBS anchor, but not here. He made it on BBC saying if he were to ask the hard questions in this country, he would be necklaced. But why wouldn't he speak up here? I mean, when the media acts as a conveyor belt for the lies of the administration, it matters because the lies take lives. And when they don't express the point of view of a cross-section of society, as well as the experts inside and outside the system, it's a disservice to the service men and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society and our media, which provides the forum for the discussion, to discuss these critical issues. Um, anything less, a disservice to the service men and women of this country, a disservice to a democratic society. And could you talk um, about how the media, from your perception, covered issues of international law or, or didn't cover them? International law is anathema to the general public in this country because the media doesn't take them seriously. And yet it's absolutely critical to understand we live in a global system, in a global community. George Bush is now turning to that global community to save him in Iraq right now, to, uh, in his run for the presidency. He knows he cannot go it alone. Uh, now that it has been a disaster, he has to put it on the shoulders of others. Um, but he has very explicitly, in fact proudly, uh, flaunted international law. And the only way he can get away with that is if the media doesn't take it seriously, because otherwise they would be continually raising these issues and explaining what international law is. Just the way the media works in eight or nine second sound bites, the average, what you can hear in those sound bites is simply a repeating of the establishment consensus. Um, you can hear uh, someone saying, Saddam Hussein is Hitler, and everyone knows what that means. If you say that the highest officials in the United States, uh, George Bush, Donald Rumsfeld, are war criminals, or there's grounds to believe that, or they should be tried, um, you sound crazy unless you explain what you have to say. And then you have to explain what war crimes are. You have to explain international law. 
but that doesn't fit into this very neat seven, eight, nine second um, format. And the media can get away with saying it's not a political edit, it's just you're not ready for prime time, you don't know how to give good sound bite. But in fact, it's fiercely political. And can, okay. and, uh, can you talk about uh, when the Democrats and the Republicans agree? Uh, you know, can in journalists, some journalists say we, can, we can't fill in the void, we just can't do it. The way the media works in this country is it reflects a very narrow spectrum of opinion. It's the opinion, the range between the Democrats and the Republicans. And when the Democrats and Republicans agree, that means that there is an icing out of all dissent before the invasion. Um, you had John Kerry, John Edwards as senators voting for the invasion. And that reflected overwhelmingly what the Democrats were saying, the Democrats that the media covers. I mean, people like Dennis Kucinich, who's also a Democratic candidate for president, uh, the media hardly covered. Um, but with the establishment uh, figures, that's who the media focuses on. And so they were iced out almost all dissent. But I would contend that mainstream America was in a very different place. At that time, in the lead up to the war, most people were opposed to the invasion. They were for more inspections, more diplomacy. So I don't even want to call it mainstream media anymore. I think we should call it extreme media. Uh, it didn't reflect mainstream America. I mean, when you have the study that FAIR does of the four major nightly newscasts, NBC, ABC, CBS, and the PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, and the week leading up to and after Colin Powell gave his address at the United Nations, uh, his push for war, they looked at the two weeks of the four major nightly newscasts, 393 interviews done around war. Only three were with anti-war representatives. That's three of almost 400. That is not mainstream media. It doesn't reflect mainstream America. That is an extreme media beating the drums for war. Okay, and um, can you talk about um, the, how the ownership actually affects the um, news coverage? Uh, what's more important, to, you know, you have the liberal media bias claims of the right, and then you have the other side is saying that it's owners, so give that. Mm -hmm. What matters is who owns the media. It doesn't matter how many channels there are. Do you need me to repeat that? that? Yeah. yeah, okay. What matters is who owns right. the media. What matters is who owns the media. It doesn't matter how many channels there are. And we are now in the midst of the greatest media consolidation in the history of this country. And that is determining the kind of views or the lack of diversity of views we're hearing. You have Colin Powell leading the war on Iraq and his son Michael Powell, chair of the Federal Communications Commission, leading the war on diversity of voices here at home, trying to launch the rules that will lead to deregulation leading to the greatest consolidation of media in this country's history. I would contend that um, media monopolies and militarism go hand in hand. And that's what we're seeing in this country right now. Uh, when you have uh, such a narrow spectrum of opinion, they're simply beating the drums for war. Okay. Um, what is your views on, you know, is regime change even legal under international law? Or, you know, people that you've talked to, um, you know, is it even legal to go overthrow another government? Um, I think even the Bush administration, um, probably privately behind closed doors, is uh, saying there was a very serious mistake made here. Um, just moving into a country and deciding you want to overthrow their government, I don't think is, a, is legitimate in most people's eyes. And what matters are the, is the American public, if it's going to be the American government that's doing this. 
And we saw it not only in Iraq, we also saw it in Haiti in the midst of the invasion, um, in the midst of the occupation in Iraq. Uh, the same thing has now happened in Haiti, and it's not legitimate. Um, people don't condone it. But if the media doesn't take it seriously, if the media adopts the language of the, those in power, for example, with the invasion, the media taking the words uh, Operation Freedom as their description of the invasion, their name for the coverage, um, you have a very serious problem. Uh, I know it was supposed to be Operation Iraqi Liberation, according to counterpunch.org, that's the name the Pentagon had come up with it. Um, and uh, they didn't like the acronym OIL, so they went to Operation Iraqi Freedom. Now, that's what the Pentagon does. They come up with the most propagandistic name. But what matters is that the networks, and not only Fox, but MSNBC, NBC, uh, CNN, adopted the title that, that the Pentagon came up with as the title of their coverage, Operation Iraqi Freedom, which is purely propagandistic. Um, you know, you have to ask then, if we had state media in this country, how would it be any different? Okay, great. That's it? Well, I mean, you said 17 minutes. I mean, no. more time. But. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, um, thank you very much. I can't believe what I put you through.